to Riley. Riley. There we go. Because she's gone and she's going to watch the screencast. All right, guys, here you go. So this is where we left off last time, which would certainly then provide a great place for you to reconnect with this material. Um, but you'll remember that when we went over this, we said, don't write this down. This was all about the interplay between solutes and solvents. And guys, fundamentally what we said is this, the traction between the solute and solvent has got to be strong enough to get the solute to turn its back on other solute particles and the solvent to turn its back on other solvent particles and then things dissolve. So guys, we looked at two ways that can They are super stuck together, but the attractions between the solute and the solvent are strong enough to overcome that and they dissolve. Then guys, we looked at this other interesting example where you've got a nonpolar solvent and a nonpolar solute. And guys, the solvent's not that attracted to itself and the solute is not attracted to itself very much. And therefore, the attractions between the solute and solvent, while they're not that strong, don't need to be that strong in order for it to dissolve and therefore this dissolves. So why then do these not dissolve? Well, guys, this one doesn't dissolve because a nonpolar solute is not strong enough to get the water to let go of other waters. And similarly here, guys, this one does not dissolve because the gasoline is not strong enough to grab a hold of the salt and pull it apart. Is that all coming back to you? And then guys, you may remember that we then summarized all of this with this statement that you promised you would never use as an explanation that is simply like dissolves like. It is certainly a great way to form your thoughts, but you will never write this down on the AP test because it is not a valid explanation. So guys, what then are the valid explanations? Can you imagine a question on the test that says, why does sugar dissolve in water? By the way, there's a question on the test. Why does sugar dissolve in water? How are you going to approach that, guys? That's not enough. It's not enough to say that they're both polar. It's the hydrogen force. Okay, that's true. But remember, guys, and don't kill the messenger. What are they going to ask you to do first? Discuss what? Exactly. You've got to talk about what's going on inside the water. Water molecules exhibit, and we're going to use the word exhibit, water molecules exhibit hydrogen forces. Then guys, what's going on inside of sugar? Sugar is a hydrocarbon, has those OH groups on it. Uh, they will show you the Lewis dot structure. You don't have to remember that. Um, but guys, sugar has these OH groups, which also then allow sugar to exhibit uh, hydrogen forces. And then because sugar and water both have the opportunity for hydrogen forces, there are also hydrogen forces between the water and the sugar. And those forces are stronger than the forces within either the solute or the solvent, and therefore it dissolves. Okay, yeah. Are you going to talk about why they're We can say it right now. It's, it's a multiplication of forces that the water molecule, so if you could look at the way sugars form crystals, um, the, the sugar molecules are large and they have these OH groups hanging off the side, which makes them ripe for, for mm -hmm. hydrogen bonding. But the problem is, is that these molecules are so large that you don't get an efficiency where, and I can't draw it well, well, sort of. So the idea is kind of this. Um, if we said that this is sort of like what a sugar looks like, and we've got an OH, and then an H, and then an OH, and then an H, and I'm just making this up. But if you've got something like this, and then if you've got another sugar molecule right here, 
and this is hugely simplified, the chances of these lining up perfectly with those to create a, a maximum number of hydrogen forces is very, very unlikely. But if you've got water molecules dancing around, oh yeah, these water molecules can get right in there and create all sorts of hydrogen forces. So it's really that solvation process where this small freely moving water molecule can surround these sugar molecules and you end up with way more of these hydrogen force interactions than you simply do between two sugar molecules. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So how is it that salt dissolves in water? Because those ion and it's remember, and I know you're saying this, it's not just the ionic bonds, right? It's also the lattice. And those have huge energies associated with them, which really gives you a sense of how strong the ion dipole forces are between water and salt. Also, how that, just a second, how that multiplication of forces, if you can picture from the video, the salt ions surrounded by water molecules. But then the other thing we haven't talked about is how the kinetic energy of those water molecules, because remember those water molecules in a liquid state are like a mosh pit. They're slamming around like crazy. And literally they bring kinetic energy to the salt as they slam into that salt molecule. And that is additional energy that breaks down the lattice. Um, that's why salt dissolves more quickly in hot water than cold water. It's literally a kinetic energy issue. And all three of those together cause salt to sodium chloride to dissolve in water. So Jessica, go ahead. So if the question on the test was why does salt dissolve in water, sodium chloride, let's just call it salt, why does sodium chloride dissolve in water? And we would talk about the, the strong ionic forces that exist in the salt, the hydrogen forces that exist in the water, and then the ion dipole forces that exist between the salt and the water. And those ion dipole forces are stronger than the forces that exist within the salt and the forces that exist within the water. That's all you need to say. Yeah, that's all the further you got to go. You guys okay? Okay. So guys, this then is where we're headed as we continue down this journey with solubility. So guys, what we need to do now is we need to talk about the environmental factors. Is the amount of a substance that can dissolve, do you remember the units? It's in your very first... liters of solvent. In this case, it's typically water. Um, but guys, we need to talk about the factors that influence solubility. So the first one is pressure. So how does pressure, and we're just going to lay these out and then I'll show you graphs. So guys, how does pressure affect solubility? And the answer is it depends. So if our system is a liquid or a solid dissolved in a liquid. So picture alcohol in water, picture salt in water. Um, guys, those systems are not affected by, um, by pressure. You can squeeze them and it doesn't change much the amount of liquid or solid that will dissolve in a liquid. Sorry, I'm searching frantically for an example of the next thing that's going to come up, but none of us are there. So guys, what about gases? Hugely. How do you know? Because you've all made the mistake of screwing the lid off a can or off a bottle of Coke, and you screw that lid off, and it goes everywhere. Guys, why does that happen? Why does screwing the lid off cause soda to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when they, when they 
Coke, they literally put the syrup in the water in a bottle or a can, and then they pressurize it with carbon dioxide and screw the lid on. And when they pressurize it, it increases the pressure inside the container, and that allows more carbon dioxide to dissolve, as you said, Doug. It allows more carbon dioxide to dissolve than should dissolve at room pressure. And when you screw the lid off, all of a sudden now the Coke inside there is experiencing room pressure and some of that carbon dioxide can't stay dissolved. Now hopefully you screw the lid off and that happens progressively and it just makes bubbles because that makes soda taste good. But guys, if you shake it first, you disrupt the system. All of that solvation that takes place as the water surround the carbon dioxide, if you shake it, it unorganizes the, the structure Structure, entropy, right? It unorganizes the structure that's taking place in there. Some of the solvating waters get dissociated from their carbon dioxide molecules. And now when you screw off the lid, it's game on. All that carbon dioxide is no longer surrounded by water. It's not able to stay dissolved and it goes nuts, comes out the top and brings the sugar and all the gook with it. Um, so guys, the idea then is that the solubility of a gas in a liquid solvent increases as the pressure goes up. So the higher the pressure, the higher the solubility. Are you good? Guys, that's also why people that scuba dive get the bends. Are you familiar with that? That when you, there's, there's, there are gases dissolved in your blood, right? And when you scuba dive, you go down in the water and that increases the pressure. As you increase the pressure, that increases the solubility of the gases in your blood. Now the problem is, is that when you're down at depth, you have gas dissolved in your blood that can't stay dissolved at the surface at less pressure. And so if you come up too quickly, um, those gases that are dissolved in your blood actually form bubbles, the same way screwing the lid off of a Coke forms bubbles. The problem is, is those bubbles are too big to fit through the capillaries in your circulatory system and they clog your circulatory system and it hurts like crazy and you bend over from the pain. That's where the term bends comes from. Yeah. No, so you actually have to be breathing additional gas. So these free divers, it's really crazy. Have you seen these guys? So free divers are these people that, that dive for depth without supplemental gases. And they literally hold their breath for two, three, and four minutes. And it's crazy when they, it's actually really interesting because when they start, they hold this weight and they slide down a line and they hold this weight and they just kind of go limp and they let this weight drag them down. But then eventually you'll see them let go of the weight um, and they continue to sink. The reason is because their body has been compressed to the point where they're now more dense than water and they're no longer buoyant and they just keep sinking. Um, so yeah, but in that case, they don't need to worry about coming up quickly. So they're not dissolving additional gas in their blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the reason is, is, I mean, our bodies are amazing systems, right? And we're, we're always in this condition of, of equilibrium. So if we come up slowly, um, our, the, the equilibria that exists between our blood and our lungs, the, the air sacs, the uh, alveoli, uh, that, not bad for not a biology guy. So there's an equilibrium between the pressure of the gas in our alveoli and the pressure of the gas in our blood. And that determines whether gases go in or out between our lungs and our blood. And as we come up, that pressure drops. And so our, our, our lungs are able to recover some of that gas if we give them time. But if we come up too quickly, then our, our lungs can't keep up with all the gas that wants to come out, and that's when it forms bubbles. So that's why you have to come up slowly. 
um, or come up quickly, get the bends, and then they put you in a hyperbaric chamber. Have you guys seen these? They literally, they on, on big diving boats, they have them on board, and it's basically this big iron container, and they shove you in there and pressurize it, and they, they push those gases back into your blood, and then they decompress you slowly. So they do the same thing for Himalayan climbers. Um, like at base camp in Everest, they have one of these things, because you know you're up at 20,000 feet, and there's no air up there. And so if you get in trouble, they'll actually put you in this thing and pressurize it. And they can actually pressurize it down to like eight or 9,000 feet. Um, and that can save your life because it does the opposite. It pushes gases back into your blood and keeps you from dying. So you guys good on these ideas? So again, the big idea is solids and liquids, solubility does not change in a, in a liquid. Gases change very much. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh gosh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, there, yes. Because there are all these, I need to be careful because we're in Utah County where we thrive on weird medicinal processes and multi-level marketing ideas. Uh, there are actually therapeutic treatments based on that, that you can pay who knows how much money and go into a hyperbaric chamber of oxygen, don't smoke. Um, and, and it actually does that. It drives the oxygen through your skin and into your bloodstream. And uh, they say it has curative you know, I, they say it helps with arthritis and wrinkling and who knows. But yeah, so, I mean, I don't know if the science is good, but it's definitely possible. Yeah. I would doubt you could get that much in. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think so. Uh, I'm kind of sick of breathing. Let's just try this a different way. Um, but Doug, the reason I'm really willing to say it wouldn't work, and I forget the numbers, but if you look at the surface area of all the alveoli in your lungs, it's phenomenal. It's like the size of a football field or something ridiculous like that. Because um, it's really that, that permeation is a function of surface area, and we could Google it. The surface area in your lungs is it's phenomenal. Um, it's just all packed into a small space where your body wouldn't have enough surface area for enough gas to permeate. So, all right, you guys good? Okay, so guys, just write this down and then stop taking notes on this page. Actually, we'll give you one more bullet. So Henry's Law. Guys, Henry's Law is fundamentally this second bullet point, but we'll give it to you. It simply says the solubility of a gas increases in direct proportion to its partial pressure above the solution. Which is really just the bullet point above. But guys, fundamentally, everything that we've just talked about is given a name. It's called Henry's Law. It's a proportional relationship. So because it is directly proportional, if you double the pressure, you double the solubility. And that's all you need to know. You okay? Okay. So guys, what I'd like to do then is I'd like to have you draw a picture of this. So what you're going to do is, is draw yourself a couple beakers. And then in both of the beaker, well, actually, in both of the beakers, put a lid. And then, uh, only put a lid on one of them. Um, then guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put some water, put an equal amount of water. These are supposed to be the same size, but you know how I struggle. And then guys, we're gonna put some gas molecules up here. And you'll notice that these gas molecules are not water molecules. You can tell because they're a uh, different color. So guys, what are these gas molecules doing if this is a video and not a picture? Bouncing around, right? And in addition to running into the lid and the walls, what else do they run into? The water. And when they run into the water, some of them are captured by intermolecular forces and they dissolve. 
but then similarly, some of them come to the surface and they come back out. And again, we reach an equilibrium and that equilibrium then determines the solubility. You get the idea? Okay, so now what we're gonna do guys is we're gonna take this system and we are going to functionally double the pressure. So what could we do to this system to double the pressure? Without, not, not by changing, we're not gonna add more gas. Make it smaller. So literally make this a plunger and push the lid down and cut the volume in half, right? Boyle's law says if you, if you half the volume, you double the pressure. They're inversely related. So now guys, the same number of gas molecules, I guess I put eight. Now the same number of gas molecules are in half the space. So what happens to this system now? Hits the water more frequently. And as it hits the water more frequently, more of them will go into solution. How much more? Twice. So doubling the pressure doubles the solubility. And the reason is because um, you, they're striking the surface more frequently and consequently more of them dissolve into solution. Does that make sense, even with my really not very good drawings? And if any of you mentions that sub. And Alyssa, you don't even get to laugh at that. <laughs> you guys good? You okay on this whole idea of, of Henry's Law? Okay, so guys, that is pressure. Now what we need to do is we need to talk about temperature. This one's sort of interesting. Well, not that the pressure one's not, but this, this is interesting. So guys, it goes like this. In a liquid solvent, water, the solubility of solids goes up with temperature. Luke, this is what we were talking about earlier, the kinetic energy that breaks the solid apart. But then guys, interestingly this, the solubility of gases decreases with temperature. So guys, in both cases, let's talk about why once you're all caught up with me. Because really, of course, it's always the whys that we need to understand. So guys, why would the solubility, let's say salt, solid solute, why does more salt dissolve in warmer water? Go ahead, Yeah. And so? Mm -hmm. So it breaks, it, but, but realize we're not just talking about rate. It does dissolve faster, but it also dissolves more. So guys, why would that be the case? Because the water molecules hit. The yes. Um, so there's more likely to be collisions resulting in solvation. That's half of it. But there's another reason. What happens to the intermolecular towards boiling, right? And so guys, as we heat the water, we're weakening the intermolecular forces between the water molecules, making those water molecules more able to leave each other and go to the salt. Does that make sense? Okay, so guys, what about the other? Because this one's a little trickier, it's counterintuitive. So guys, why does the solubility of a gas go down with temperature, yeah? Yeah, you're, you're, you're on the right path, but I don't know if we're all the way there. So guys, let's go back to our system like this. And then let's say we've got some gas dissolved up here. I'm sorry, we've got some gas in the vapor phase up here. And then I'm not representing the water molecules. This is, say it's oxygen, our red is oxygen. So guys, as we heat the water, what's changing in the water? As we heat it, what are the molecules doing? Moving faster. But so are the gas molecules. 
Get it? So if the gas molecules are moving faster, they are more likely to jump into the vapor phase, and every molecule that jumps into the vapor phase is no longer dissolved. Does that make sense? So when we heat the liquid, we're also heating the solute, the gas. And because that's true, it increases the vapor pressure of the gas, and that means less of it's dissolved in water. Is that OK? And you guys all understand the implication of this, right? In the summer, why is the fishing horrible midday? Why do you fish in the morning and the evening? It's cooler. So what does that matter? Well, guys, during the middle of the day, the fish are suffocating. You guys understand this, right? Yes, water is H2O, but that is not the oxygen that fish breathe, right? The gills of a fish do not rip the water molecules apart and allow them to isolate the oxygen. So what are the fish actually breathing? the O2 that's dissolved in the water. And guys, midday, the surface of the water warms up. Where does the oxygen they breathe come from? The air around the lake or wherever they are. And guys, midday, the surface of that water warms, less oxygen dissolves into the water, there's less oxygen available to the fish, and they are, they're, they're, they're not able to breathe as well. And understand that hunting for food is a very aerobic activity, and if they're out looking for food, then they aren't able to sustain that. It's like they're breathing through a straw trying to go for a run. But then guys, in the morning and the evening, the water cools, there's more oxygen available to them. They're able to hunt for food more efficiently because they have more oxygen available to sustain the efforts. Hmm? Ah, there you go. You guys are learning so much. You guys also understand that in rivers, that's why the fishing is best below the riffles. Because guys, in the riffles, the surface of the water is disturbed and it allows more oxygen to dissolve. So the most oxygenated water in a, in a river is the, is the water below the riffles where it's been all, and there you go. So guys, graphically, we can show you that this way. So you'll notice that on the left, we have solubility, again, in grams of salt per 100 milliliters of water. And guys, notice that as the temperature goes up, the solubility of these solutions go up. Um, you can get more solid to dissolve in the liquid with the exception of cesium sulfate, and I have no idea why. Then guys, you'll notice over here on the right, we have temperature versus solubility for gases, and the solubility of these gases decreases with increased temperature, just as we set up above. You guys good? You're okay? Okay. So guys, we have one more thing that we need to talk about relative to solubility, and then we're going to switch into the fundamentals of gases. So guys, it's this. Let's take, for example, I don't know, let's go potassium nitrate. So we're going to, and you can't see that, can you? Okay. So guys, we're going to focus on potassium. No, bad example. Let's go, it's not a bad example, but there are better examples. Let's do the potassium chromate, dichromate. So that guy right there. So guys, we are going to look at the solubility of potassium dichromate. So let's say 20 degrees, which is room temperature, how much potassium dichromate will dissolve in 100 grams of water at 20 degrees? About, about 10. Now guys, let's go to 90, Let's go to 90 degrees, just short of boiling. How much of this will dissolve in 90 degree water? About 70 grams. And guys, um, again, a representation of the fact that solubility goes up with temperature, right? But guys, we can take this and we can do something really interesting. You can create what is called a super saturated solution. And here's how you do it. You take your water and you heat it up to 90 degrees and you add your 70 grams of potassium dichromate and you let it dissolve. And it all has to dissolve. 
So what you have is a hot solution of potassium dichromate. And then guys, what you do from there is you then turn off the Bunsen burner and you let it cool. And as it cools back down to room temperature, guess what happens? Nothing. So guys, what we've just created is called the supersaturated solution. We dissolve 70 grams of this salt in hot water and then we allowed it to cool. And when you do, there should only be 10 gram, 20 degrees, there should only be 10 grams of salt. So we now have 60 grams of potassium dichromate dissolved in that water that shouldn't be there. So guys, why does that work? And the answer is because at 90 degrees Celsius, can you picture all of those potassium dichromate ions surrounded in water? Well, if you cool them down slowly, those water molecules will continue to associate with the salt ions and they will not reassociate with each other, keeping the crystal from forming until you drop in one crystal of the potassium dichromate and then all 60 grams of potassium dichromate crash out a solution simultaneously and the entire system turns into sludge because you've basically got 60 grams of potassium uh, dichromate that precipitate all at once and it's actually pretty crazy cool to watch. Um, guys, that is what is called the supersaturated solution. Now, you may have had experience with this. Have you ever made rock candy at home? If you've never done this, it's actually really kind of fun. You take water and you dissolve sugar in it. And hot water, you, you boil it. You boil the water and you dissolve as much sugar in there as you possibly can. And then, guys, you let it cool. You just made a supersaturated solution. But the trick is, is instead of dropping in sugar to get it to crystallize, you drop a string into it. And that string provides a surface upon which the crystals can form and you crystallize the sugar onto the string and it turns into candy. You guys have never done this? Yeah, so guys, that is another example of this whole phenomenon of supersaturated solutions. Oh. What did I do? So guys, these then are the terms that you need to know relative to these. Um, the, the term that you need to know, you may just want to write this down, is a seed crystal. The, and don't write down the rest of this, please. You understand the, you know how to make it, you understand the concept, but the idea able. And when you add a seed crystal, that crystallizes in some interesting ways. Yeah. So long as the water doesn't evaporate, no. Um, but we've tried in the past, like, you know, we're going to have that weird time after we're done with the AP test where we're not quite sure what to do with ourselves. Um, one year, my classes tried to make supersaturated solutions, and the problem was, is if there, microscopically, if there is any crystal of salt either on the surface or stuck to the glassware, um, as it cools, it just crystallizes. We couldn't make one. We couldn't get it to work. Um, it, it's amazing how little crystal it takes to get this to go. So it's, a, but have you guys ever seen these things? Um, these these heat packs where you boil them in water and then you let them sit and then there's a little snap button on the side and you push it and it crystallizes and gets warm. That's all you're doing is making a super saturated solution. Um, inside there is a salt in water and when you boil it, you heat it up, the salt dissolves into the water or whatever's in there, whatever the solvent is. And then you take it out and it just sits there. It's in a closed bag, it's a sealed system. But then inside that little snap thing, 
Not exactly sure how it works, but when you squeeze it, it introduces a surface upon which that salt can crystallize. And that crystallization takes place throughout the entire system. And it's exothermic and it gets warm. That's how those, that's how those heat packs work. So guys, I can actually show you video, videos of this. So what we have here is a close up of one of these supersaturated systems. This is actually supersaturated um, sodium acetate. This, and then, so they go bink, and there's the seed crystal, and it all just crashes out of solution. Or this is a bunch of high school students trying to do the same thing. And if you listen to them, they're not terribly intelligent. Oh my god. Oh, it looks like a little puffball. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you gotta turn it upside down as soon as it's frozen. Oh my god, it's so good. It's so solid. <laughs> so in their minds, anything that's solid is frozen. And, uh, but the thing that is, well, I guess we should say two things. One, I'm calling them out on some of the stupid things they say, but they were able to make a supersaturated solution when I couldn't. So where does that place me? Uh, but guys, in addition to that, it is interesting. If you take this and flip it over, nothing comes out. It is very much, a, it's a very gelatinous system. It's like jello. It's really interesting. So guys, you okay on the idea of supersaturated systems? All right, so guys, you've already got this homework written down, right? All right, so let's get rid of this. And this is gonna take us just a few minutes. And guys, we are now going to touch on, well, we're gonna talk about everything that you should have learned last year about, about gases. This is literally a review of everything you learned last year. I stole all of these, well, here. I stole all of these slides out of general chemistry lectures. Remember the Tosvok. It's right there. Oh, I know. So, guys, I'm going to treat this as review. If you have questions along the way, everything that you learned last year, we're going to treat it as such. Um, but please stop me if you need. And along the way, there are some things that I'll highlight as well. So guys, this is where we are now. So we're in the middle of this conversation about intermolecular forces, and we now appreciate the idea that intermolecular forces are not, a, are not an end to themselves. They're a means to this end because we can talk about things like phases and phase changes and stuff like that. So guys, when we picture a solid, we picture these particles. Hi. Thank you. No, you're great. Thanks so much. I was admiring your purse, actually. And now she's gone. And she thinks I'm weird. I know. I know. So guys, solids, we're picturing these particles locked in space and vibrating. Liquids, our mental picture is mosh pit. And then gases, we're picturing a system where the particles spread out. The intermolecular forces, for all intensive purposes, have become, have become non-effective. And these things just spread out to fill the container. You guys good? Okay. So guys, when we talk about gases, we understand that in order to study these things mathematically, they're, they're literally chaotic systems. And so consequently, we talk about a simplified model of gases. And guys, our simplified model allows us to study these things in a more accessible way. And importantly, it doesn't change largely the results of, of our study. And so we call these ideal gases, right? Okay. And so guys, what are the two oversimplifications when we talk about ideal gases? Ideal gas molecules have dot, 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 no intermolecular forces and no volume. They have mass, but no volume, which means that they're there, but they don't take up space and they have no intermolecular forces. So guys, these are our oversimplifications. 
They have mass but no volume and no intermolecular forces. Now guys, I think that this is going to be an important time to talk about why this works. So let's draw some pictures. So let's get a balloon, sort of. And then let's get some gas molecules. We'll put one in the middle. So guys, why does this work? Why, and actually, you know what? This is actually not even terribly representative. So guys, why does this work? Why is it acceptable to say that these molecules have mass but no volume and no intermolecular forces? Because it works pretty darn well. Why does it work? Yeah, so we, we know the gas has mass, but why is it okay to disregard the volume? And why is it okay to disregard the intermolecular forces? Okay. Okay, yeah, we're, we're headed in the right direction. Go ahead. in a really small container, then it matters. And for those of you that are in lab, you just did a lab on this. John was picking the numbers apart, which was awesome. Because why does it work? Go ahead. Just go ahead, Sam. No, so what, yeah, fundamentally what we're digging at is what is the difference between an ideal and a real gas? But the way that we're asking the question is, why is it acceptable to treat a gas as if it's ideal? Why is it okay to ignore the intermolecular forces? Why is it okay to ignore the volume of the molecules themselves? So most of the time, like in the big container, Yep. But that's not because of movement. There's one answer to this question. That's it. Because that's it. They're so spread out. Guys, these molecules are so spread out that what's the chances of them sticking to each other? Pretty close to none. And guys, these molecules are so spread out, how much does the size of the molecules themselves make? You may remember last year, I likened this to growing up in Wyoming. Guys, where I grew up in Wyoming, I couldn't see my neighbors. And my neighbor could have very easily come in and ripped their house down and built a bigger house, and it wouldn't have changed my existence at all. Why not? Because there's so much empty space between me and my neighbors. Guys, the same thing's true of molecules. There's so much free space around these molecules that the size of the molecules doesn't really matter. And they're so far apart from each other that they're intermolecular forces, just like magnets, right? Guys, when we get magnets up against each other, they stick like crazy. But when I take these magnets and do this, are they attracting each other anymore? Technically, yes. But it's imperceivable because they're, they're still magnets, but they're so far apart that their traction is no longer important. Guys, that's what's going on inside of a gas. These molecules still have the potential for polarity, induced dipoles, but they're so spread apart that we don't worry about the attraction because it's so in, unimportant given the distances between them. Does that make sense? So guys, why is it one, one answer? Why is it okay to think of gases as if they're ideal. They're so spread apart. But guys, there's a better way to say that. 
Why is it okay to think of gases as if they're ideal? Low density. Guys, their densities are low. They're all spread out. But then, guys, you ready for the tie back to second period? What if we make the density high? Then it matters. Guys, if you can smush these gas molecules down into a small enough space, increasing the density, then all of a sudden it matters. So John, remind us, how do we do that? You talked about this second period. How do we smush these molecules down into a smaller space? What do we do? Increase the pressure or decrease the temperature, right? So guys, if you take a gas and cool it down enough, those molecules are going to come together and it's not going to behave ideally anymore. We're going to study that in a couple days. Or if you increase the pressure enough, those molecules are going to scrunch down and sometimes behave so unideally that they become a liquid. So guys, understand the only reason that we can treat gases as being ideal is because they're low density systems. They're all spread out. But if you can take that low density system and make it a high density system, then treating them as ideal is no longer appropriate. Does that make sense? You're okay? Okay, were you gonna add something? You're all right? Okay, let me put this away. Ah, I gotta, what is, holy smokes. All right, we're going to leave that there. All right, so guys, that was thought number one. You guys are good with ideal gases? Okay, so again, reviewing, moving along, standard temperature and pressure. You guys good on that? Okay, so temperature and pressure change the volume. Therefore, we need standards. Standard temperature is zero Celsius or 273 Kelvin. Remember, Kelvin is Celsius plus 273. Is that review enough that we can just keep clicking? Then guys, do we need to go over Kelvin scale? Okay. Then um, standard pressure is uh, the pressure at sea level on an average day. For reference, it's about 14 and a half PSI, which is then equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is TOR, um, or we can also use atmospheres and we just call it one atmosphere of pressure. And again, guys, that's review. So do we need to talk about any of the rest of that? Oh, and then also uh, 101.3 kilopascals. Did you guys all install the uh, barometer app on your phone? You guys should do that if you haven't. Um, the one on, because you're going to need this in lab. Um, the one on the iPhone, it's free, but the one that I like the best is actually just called barometer. Um, frankly, I don't uh, interact with the Android world enough to know, but I would assume that there's a free one of those as well. The thing I like about the one in the App Store called Barometer is it actually allows you to switch the units. Um, so it gives you pressure at sea level. Um, it, it talks to a weather station at sea level. So it gives you pressure at sea level, and then it taps into the, the, the barometer in your phone you guys know there, we talked about this, right? There's a pressure. It gives you the pressure here, not based upon uh, a weather station, but based upon the barometer in your phone. Yeah. Yeah, why so many different units? Um, well, I mean, this is, this is a remnant of the, the, um, the imperial system, right? Pounds and inches. Um, but then relative to, um, so historically, these are interesting ideas. Historically, this has been our, um, our, our it's probably the oldest unit of pressure. This is literally Blaise Pascal, the same guy that came up with the triangle. Um, yeah, sort of a Renaissance dude. Um, and so these are units that, that he first derived in studying pressures. Um, frankly, atmospheres were, were determined later because it was simpler. It's easier to deal with one, right? So it's hard to say 202.6 kPa. It's easier to say two atmospheres. Um, so this was just done out of convenience. And then frankly, this one comes from barometers. Um, so 
they stole my barometer, but I think we've talked about this, that a barometer is literally a glass tube that's inverted into a beaker full of mercury, and then they draw a vacuum on the beaker, uh, they draw a vacuum on the tube and then seal it. Um, and so literally as they draw the vacuum, it sucks mercury up the tube and then they seal it. And so eventually you end up with the surface of mercury and up here is a vacuum. There's nothing in there. And so what happens then is the atmosphere pushes down on the surface of the mercury. The greater the atmospheric pressure, the longer the column of mercury. The lower the atmospheric pressure, the shorter the column of mercury. And then you literally just stick a meter stick to the side, and this is what I used to have, and they took it. You literally stick a meter stick to the side of this, and at sea level on an average day, the column of mercury supported by pressure would be 760 millimeters tall. Um, and then on a higher pressure day, more pressure on the mercury, it would go higher. Lower pressure day, less pressure, it would go lower. Um, so like when you watch the news, if you ever do, and they say um, the barometric pressure is 29.73 or whatever, that's actually inches of mercury. Um, but that's, that used to be the, the gold standard for measuring atmospheric pressure is how tall is the column of mercury that the atmosphere will support. Um, and the guy that was thinking about that, his name was something Tor, so they interrelated the two. So, interesting question. Why then don't they make barometers out of water? Yeah, it would have to be like 10 meters tall because water has such a low density that the atmosphere would support a column of water that would be meters and meters and meters tall. But you understand then the implication of that, right? It means that there's then theoretically a limit to how tall a straw you could drink out of. And you can drink out of a longer straw at sea level than you can here, right? I mean, seriously, that's true. Because, guys, you understand this. You guys understand that when you drink through a straw, you are not sucking liquid through the straw. You're simply pulling the air out and allowing the atmosphere to ram the soda down your throat. Yeah? You guys don't get out enough. I mean, if you were to try to drink mercury, there's a limit to how long your mercury straw could be. And right now, I wonder if I can even switch it to inches. Um, settings, inches of mercury, and how do I, and then I just go back. John, what do you have over there? Make it go away. Um, oh, here. So, guys, going back then. So, right now, pressure here is 25 and a half inches. So, if you were to try to drink mercury, if you had a 26 inch straw, you couldn't do it. <laughs> guys. All right. So, you guys good on standard pressure and temperature stuff? Did I, did I tell you about that when I did that with one? I used to teach summer school, which meant teaching science to kids that were incapable of passing science classes. So I had to find a way to entertain them. And we actually grabbed rubber tubing and went out and tried to build it off the back of the football stadium, tried to build a barometer out of water. And what we sadly found is that the tube kept collapsing under its own weight and uh, we couldn't get it to work. All right, you guys good? Okay, so here we go then, guys. Charles Law. Guys, Charles Law says this. The volume of a gas... Well, fundamentally, it looks like this. Temperature up, volume up. Temperature down, volume down. Now, guys, we had this conversation last year, but now we can have it in such a way that you may actually understand it. So let's do questions, and then we'll get a little deeper. Um, yeah, so we, like, 
No. Um, you know, Luke, I don't know. Um, I, I get to look so infrequently at multiple choice questions. Um, they, well, it's weird. So multiple choice questions are really hard to write. Um, to get them to actually test the things that they want them to test. So in the last couple of years, they've been much more generous with releasing extra credit or releasing multiple choice questions um, simply because they switch the format of the test and they're trying to help us out. Um, but I haven't seen a full multiple choice test probably in five years, four years. Um, so I've never had students come back after taking the multiple choice test and say they expected us to know what Boyle's Law was by name. So I, I've, never, I've never had it be a complaint. Um, at the end of the year this year, um, I will be giving you as practice tests the last two released exams. Um, we could look there. Um, but I've never heard it as a complaint. So I, I wouldn't worry so much about knowing them by name. But you certainly need to know the relationships. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay, there you go. So that's, thank you. That's, that's great insight. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. So they, they throw in the name, but they don't, they don't just say Charles Law. Okay. So guys, with that said, the conversation that I'd like to have with you right now is about why it has to be Kelvin temperature. It is not directly related to Celsius or Fahrenheit temperature. Not truly direct. We understand temperature goes up, the volume goes up, but the true direct relationship only exists with Kelvin. Why? Guys, they have a common zero point. Now let's talk about why. And guys, this is theoretical, but remember that lab, the absolute zero lab that we did last year, where you had to go drip, 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 and measure the volume of the dropper in drips? And guys, you may remember that as a result of that, you drew a graph, and um, this was volume, and this was temperature, and you started at negative 300 and went down from there and you did this, and that became your estimate of absolute zero. Do you remember that? And this was the point where volume is zero. Well, guys, why does that work? So let's talk about it. So imagine that you have a balloon of gas, and it's an ideal gas. Guys, why, do the ga why does a gas fill a balloon if the particles themselves don't take up space? Because they're moving. So guys, if the, and not if, because the volume of a gas is attributed to movement. Stick that in your head. The volume of a gas is attributed to movement. So if those molecules stop moving, what does their volume then become? Zero. Understand that begs the oversimplification that the gas never liquefies and the gas never freezes, but it's a pretty good approximation. So the idea is that these have both got to be at zero because the volume of the gas becomes zero at absolute zero because we attribute the volume of the gas to the movement of the particles and not the particles themselves. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. Okay. So guys, so that, that is, is char char uh, 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 is Boyle's, Boyle's Law, law which is the other. other. Boyle's, Boyle's law, law talks about the, the inverse, inverse relationship, relationship between pressure, pressure, and pressure and volume. And guys, you may have noticed both of these tie back to that idea of density. density. As the pressure goes, goes up, the volume going down, 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 more dense. More dense. As the temperature goes down, the volume goes down, more dense. More dense. There's lots There's of lots interesting of relationships, relationships here. Is this okay? It's okay. And then you may remember last time in class, we talked about these ideas where they, they send up weather balloons partially inflated because as they go up in the atmosphere, the pressure goes down, the volume goes up. If they launch them fully inflated, they would go up and they would pop um, because their volume increases as the atmospheric pressure goes down. 
Is that coming back to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Happens frequently. All right. And then, guys, um, I don't think. So the math of this, you guys remember the equation? P1, V1, T1, P2, V2, T2. Remember, remove the variables that are constant and solve for what you don't know. Okay. You guys, do we? Okay. And then, guys, finally, Avogadro's principle. Um, if you remember last year as we talked about this, we, we posed the interesting question. If you have a 30-gallon trash can, and you're filling that thing with objects, does it take more tennis balls or volleyballs to fill a trash can? Tennis balls, right? Because they're smaller. And so we establish this counterintuitive principle that says that it takes more small things to fill a space than it takes big things to fill a space. And we obviously see that represented here that it takes more small things to fill the space than big things. It takes more airsoft pellets than it does ping pong balls to fill a beaker. But then we applied this to gases and we said, okay, if these beakers are filled with gases and if they contain different gases, like if this contains hydrogen, which is a very simple molecule, and if this contains butane, which is a large organic molecule, um, would it take more small hydrogens to fill the space than it would large butanes to fill a similar space? And we remember the answer is no. It takes the same number of particles. And then we talked about the idea is because if these are our hydrogens and if these are our butanes, neither one of them fills the space because of the size of the molecules. They fill the space because of the movement of the molecules and their relative sizes are insignificant. Consequently, it takes the same number of particles to fill a space regardless of how large the molecules themselves are. But guys, remember that this only holds true if the temperatures and pressures are the same. And this then leads us to what is called Avogadro's principle, which says this. If you have two similar gases, these samples will contain the same number of molecules because the particles aren't in contact, but they're rapidly moving objects. But then guys, remember that when we talk about this term similar, that means that the pressures, the volumes, and the temperatures have got to be the same. And then guys, you may remember that that led us to an interesting idea. So we understand that in Avogadro's principle, it's saying this is not the deal. It's not more small things than little things to fill a space. This is the deal. By the way, guys, what phase is this representative of? Solids. In solids, it's true, but not in gases. So what we have then is a relationship that says if the pressure and the volume and the temperature are the same, then the number of molecules will be the same. But guys, what are the units that we use to measure numbers of molecules? Moles. And then all of a sudden, we've got moles, pressure, volume, and temperature, which is the foundation for PivNERT. Pressure, volume, temperature, number of moles. That's where PivNERT comes from. But then remember, guys, hot in the middle of PivNERT is R, which is the universal gas constant. And the idea here is if you multiply the pressure and volume of a gas together, and if you multiply the number of moles by the Kelvin temperature, they are not, in fact, equal but they are different by the same factor, uh, which is then represented by the universal gas constant, R. Then guys, you need to remember that the units for R, solving for R, it's PV divided by NT, and so the units for R 
our, um, our, our liter kilopascals per mole Kelvin. So it's pressure, volume in liters, pressure in kPa, N in moles, and T in Kelvin. So those are the units for R. And then the value, guys, is 8.31. Let me make sure that's what they gave you on the equation sheet. Piv nert. Yeah, 8.314. Guys, you'll notice that the units, if you look on the AP equation sheet, um, they actually give you the units in joules per mole Kelvin. The, the numerical value is the same. We'll talk more about how you can get energy out of this later. For now, just understand that it's 8.31. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and isn't it like 0.08206? Exactly. So the idea is that, and guys, I, I think you understand this. We can measure pressure, as Susanna said, there's like 11 different units for pressure, right? And similarly for volume, could be milliliters, liters, cups, quarts, gallons, temperature could even be in Celsius or Fahrenheit. So the two that you're going to deal with is we'll always go liters, we'll always go moles, we'll always go Kelvin. If it's pressure in KPA, it's 8.31. If the pressure is in atmospheres, then it's the 0.08206. I don't, do they give you, someone was, is that on the equation sheet? I frankly don't recall. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah, okay. So if you look on the equation sheet, they do give you that, the 0.08206, which means there's a very real chance those are the units that I used in solving the homework problems. Okay, so guys, this is the value that you remember from last year. This is very well. Well, this will be the value you'll use on the AP. You towards atmospheres. So guys, there you have it. Um, ideal gas stuff. All of that is right here. We've gone through that. And there's your homework. I'll just take it from you. Thanks, Ricky.